Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and how are you guys doing? This is the seventh episode of the MH podcast and I'm joined by a very, very special guest, Mufti Munir, who uh, is otherwise known as the Hadith Disciple. He's um, a, um, a graduate from the student of the University of Medina and um, he's well known online as well for his uh, excellent durus uh, uh, on Hadith Disciple YouTube channel. Is that correct? Is that the name of the YouTube channel? That's, that's right, that's right, that's right. Hadith Disciple. Um, and so, uh, actually, one of the things that he's known for is being able to, to kind of pragmatize himself, synthesize Islamic knowledge with practical knowledge of the world, and be very much um, flexible in terms of his understanding of the, the religion and balanced in his approach when dealing with very controversial issues. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, uh, Mufti. Pleasure. A pleasure to be hosted. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate it. Alhamdulillah. The last time we met in America, wasn't it? San Francisco, right? Yes, I think it was. Uh, was it San Francisco? It was it um, Sacramento? Sacramento. That's right. San Sacramento. Sacramento. Yes. In the um, I had a debate with Edward Tabash, and you were there, and right. I had the right. pleasure of meeting you and a few right. other uh, Mashaikh. Mashallah, was a beautiful business. experience. Real pleasure, Allah. It was real. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. Waiting for you to come back to the UK. Inshallah. Hopefully, you know the flights open up. You know, but now I think I think the flights open now. Yeah, so when, whenever yeah. you're ready, you know? Inshallah. I just don't again. want to sit in quarantine for 14 days. <laughs> what I wanted to start off by asking um, is, obviously you've gone through a, a rigorous process of like uh, student of knowledge type of material, and um, you went to the university, you've done studies there. If someone wants to start now learning the religion of Islam, understanding the Quran and the Sunnah, what kind of plan would you put for them in place? What kind of thing would you put for them? Where should they start? This is a question a lot of people ask. Where should we start in terms of understanding the deen? What mm. would you recommend? What kind of program would you recommend for them? Clear. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. I would say, um, it's a fork in a row. You either want to be, uh, you have the availability of a teacher, yeah. a mentor, a guide, regardless of the level. Someone who's with you all of the time, someone you see once a week, once a month, even online. Or you're totally self-taught. And you don't have a teacher available. You don't have a structured program in front of you available. And sometimes uh, in 2020, in a virtual war, COVID-19, we'll have a mixture of the two. I have a teacher in person, but I also have access to a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of recordings, lessons, at ETC. So if you have a teacher and an instructor in person, we're talking about a real life person, then of course, best to ask them and let them guide you and let them summarize and break down and simplify things for you. If you don't have a teacher, then you're going to have to do that yourself. And that's not necessarily a disadvantage in 2020. Me personally, I have a student um, in New York City, one of my students, we were doing a lecture together once, this was maybe three, four years ago. And he said that ignorance in 2017 or 2017 is a choice. It's a choice. It's not like back in the day in which only the aristocrats had uh, access to knowledge. Only people of high birth had access to certain types of knowledge. People of certain races could read and had access to libraries. Uh, only, only people that had uh, access of money could travel. In 2020, every single Abdullah, Zaid, Bakr, Amr, Tom, Dick, and Harry has access to not some knowledge, but a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge. And all of these things are in light of um, the different revolutions of the world, the industrial revolution, um, the concept of empires falling, colonies, um, people winning their independence, globalization, ETC. So all of these things play a huge role, a huge role on the access and the availability towards knowledge. Imam Abu Dawud, Ta'ala, as you know in his seerah, um, the Amir, the governor of Basra, after uh, they had a lot of fighting, a lot of problems, different revolts and rebellions, revolutions, big fit that was known in, in Basra and the time of Abu Daud. So the city or much of the city was burnt, burnt to a crisp. Uh, many things were destroyed. Many people were killed. Lives were wasted. People were violated. And the governor of Basra, he wanted to rebuild Basra. He wanted to, you know, make it a sprawling metropolis once more. He wanted to rebuild it. And from the plans, or from his, uh, his tactics, was to make Basra once more a heartland of knowledge. 
and a center of knowledge, a stronghold of the ilm. Just look at the wisdom of this leader, this political leader now. Look at his hikmah. And he knew that Imam Abu Dawood, rahimahullah ta'ala, was the best, or at least one of the best in the business at the time. One of the most learned people of knowledge and of hadith. So Imam, he made uh, Imam Abu Dawood an offer. He offered him, obviously, a place to stay, a place to live, a way of surviving, you know, etc. But he put stipulations upon Abu Dawood. And one of the stipulations that he placed upon him was, he says that you'll come to the royal palace and you'll hold classes for hadith for me and my sons. Me and my sons, the princes or, you know, the, the emirs under me. You'll give us personal classes. And obviously the emir of Basra, he can't sit with this servant, this peasant, this person who's a slave, this person of this ancestry. I can't sit with them. It's, it's an embarrassment. It's a humiliation. And uh, he made other conditions and stipulations. Imam Abu Dawood, rahimahullah ta'ala, he agreed to them except for that condition. And he said that knowledge cannot be for one class. Knowledge cannot be for an aristocrat without the peasantry. Knowledge is not for someone of a bloodline or of a DNA or of a genealogy. So the moral of the story was is that that Amir, he was following suit in the tradition, is that there's knowledge only for certain people, for certain classes. But in 2020, within a number of milliseconds, not a second, seconds, milliseconds, you press one button and you have a wealth of ilm in front of you, a wealth of ilm. All right, and obviously that's a blessing and that's also a curse. You have to be careful as well. So with that being said, we have to understand that knowledge is, a, ignorance is a choice in our times. It is a choice. So those brothers who want to study, sisters who want to study, they want to benefit. I think oftentimes we talk about it too much. We dramatize it too much. We romanticize it too much instead of just doing it. Bismillah. And just because you start off on the wrong foot or you don't have everything proper in the beginning doesn't mean that you can't change. Uh, we know the famous narration of the companions, some of them, they said, uh, We had no specific intention when we started seeking ilm. And then afterwards, Allah gave us the proper intention. Al-Dahbi, rahimahullah, he said concerning this athar, he said, Pure souls are never pleased with ignorance. Pure souls, good people, they're never comfortable with just being ignorant. So the concept is, is that they started off and didn't have the proper intention. And then later on it came. So with that being said, a teacher, a program, a curriculum, we always say hadith disciple, the philosophy has to come first. And we're very uh, yani strong proponents for what we call the pop culture. And I don't mean by pop culture, actors and singers and dancers and musicians, POP, meaning purity of philosophy. Purity of philosophy. So our mindsets have to be correct before we even think about taking a step. And the people, I don't think their philosophy is pure when it comes to seeking ilm. People think, oh, I have to seek knowledge in this country or with this person or just like this. And, and I have to say this. And nah, nah, nah. Knowledge is, is up here, first and foremost. And once you get it up here and your philosophy is pure, everything physical becomes easier. So therefore, the curriculum or your teacher, inshallah ta'ala, it should be something simple. It should be something clear. It should be something easy and digestible. Something that you can take small bites. Something you can walk slowly and gradually build and wind up your momentum, inshallah ta'ala. So baby steps are important. Longevity is important. Ease and simplicity. And it goes back to the purity of philosophy. Many people, they think, we have a book, uh, Methan and uh, 40 Hadith Noe. We have a shark, which is 50 pages, and the author isn't that known, or isn't that famous, isn't that reputed. And then we have a 500-page explanation of a great, great famous scholar. The beginning student thinks, oh, I have to read the 500-page book that he can't handle. He can't understand. It's way too much. It's way above and beyond him. But because his philosophy isn't pure, he ignores the 50-page explanation. And eventually, he quits. They get burnt out. Sheikh Bulan uses the dictionary every two seconds, every word, and he ends up and then jumps onto another book and another class. And those are the brothers and the sisters. Unfortunately, we see five years later, ten years later, not studying anymore, dropping out of school. I'm back home. What happened? I thought you were in Medina. Oh well, you know, I, you know, because they didn't take the proper steps and and progressiveness to the All right. So your teacher or yourself. Whatever program you use, Medina, Egypt, Yemen, South Africa, whatever program you use, 
It should be simple and easy. And it should be a step to build up your momentum. And then you start taking jumps and leaps later on, whatever that program may be. As far as what to study first, then before you even get into Quran, and before you even get into the Arabic language, once more, I would say is you should dig further into the culture of Taliban. Dig further into the culture. Read the books, listen to the lectures, sit in the classes about how to be a student of knowledge. And what is a student of knowledge and what isn't a student of knowledge? Because those mm. are the things that allow you to have longevity. Jumping in and out of the class, learning Arabic, Arabiya, Bania Day, Medina, Ajukmiya, you burn out. But you have to become ingrained and engrossed with the talib. And that I am a student of knowledge, I love knowledge, and I want to seek it whether I'm in jail, whether I'm in the UK, whether I'm in the scorching sands of Arabia or Mauritania, wherever you are, the mindset, everything begins and ends with the mind. So start off with the adab of talab. And alhamdulillah, in Arabic, there are countless books. In English, there are countless books, lectures. And your teacher, if he's a good teacher, the first thing that he's going to try to do is to get you to, to be devoted to this art, this culture of seeking knowledge and being a student of knowledge for real and not a fraudulent one. Wallahu alam. You know, um, when you were saying, Jazakumullah khairan for that, when you were saying about Abu Dawood's story, Rahimahullah, I was thinking about the ayat of the Quran where Nuh alayhi salam, when um, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta 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 describes his story, and then people says, you know, لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ وَاتَّبَعَكَ الْأَرْضَ لُونَ And then he says, قَالَ you know, وَمَعْنَا بِطَالِدِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ I'm not going to leave the mu'mineen just because they're lowly class. And, and this idea, is even repeated, if I remember as well, in Surah Al-An'am, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the same thing to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the idea of the, 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 the knowledge is actually for all classes and all people. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's a beautiful one that's is throughout the Quranic discourse, from Nuh all the way to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's it's a beautiful thing about our religion. And mm -hmm. I'm not kind of for outlining that story because it was actually a very profound story that I don't think many people would have come across. Um, and something else I wanted to um, mention as well, based on the last comment that you made, was um, about, like the adab of talabul ilm, or the, the mannerisms and the etiquettes and the spirituality that has to come with it. And one, mm -hmm. there's one book that changed my life in reading it um, is Bidayat al Hidayah or the Ghazal. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In the beginning, in the first couple of chapters, he demarcates, and it's actually translated to English. It's called the beginning of guidance or something like that. And he says that if you're if you're um, if you're doing talabul ilm, if you're trying to learn in order to get to to compete with your peers, you know, then you're basically the right. game is over. Yeah, and so it's what what kind of a, like this is a, a beautiful thing because number one, you're saying it's open. The ilm is open, but number two, also you have to have the right kind of spirit, psycho spiritual state before. Uh, mm -hmm. coming to uh, Talab al um, On a really practical level, you mentioned a couple of books at the end. If someone now is, okay, he, he agrees with that, and, um, and he or, or she wants to now embark upon just a very basic, this person is just, let's say, for example, wasn't practicing Islam, now is starting to practice Islam, an extremely basic program. What would, what would they start with? An extremely basic program? Mm. Right. Um, well, first and foremost, an extremely, and I have a very important point you mentioned about the spirituality yeah. and the psycho spiritual realm, uh, Ghazali, um, of course, the uh, works that came after Ghazali's uh, Ihya Ulum al Deen, uh, the Mukhtasar, several different versions of that, Ma'id al Tumutaqeen, Minhaj al Qasidin. And in the beginning of all of those books, there is Kitab al Ilm. And he talks about seeking knowledge for Tanafus, your peers comp competing. And that's, that's very, very, very stark in our society. And Hajj al is actually translated into English as well, I think. They've got mm -hmm. translation. It's, by, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not the Ibn Qadam, it's his cousin or something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's several. Yeah. Um, then you have, uh, he also mentioned about how people, they'll focus on the technical knowledge and ignore the spirituality behind it. And they don't want to seek the knowledge of the soul. And that's very stark as well. People, they seek knowledge just for the technicalities, for land, for land, for land, for land. But they ignore their soul. 
And that, that, that's an issue. At the end of the day, a very yeah. simple, basic, easy program for a person, 10 key points or 10, uh, 10 key guidelines to seeking knowledge. Yeah. Uh, excellent yeah. book in Arabic and English. Al-Rakah is Al-Ashab Lit-Tahseel Al-Ilmi by Abdullah Salfiq. Uh, that's in Arabic and in English as well. That's a very concise, lean book that gives you 10 main successes or pieces of success to seek knowledge. That's very, that's very important. Mm -hmm. And there are other books as well. Uh, afterwards, a Muslim, bidinai ta'ala, he should learn the basics of the recitation of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. The basics of how to recite the Qur'an properly. Not to be a tajweed master, but the basic, simple, proper recitation of the, the five prayers. All right? Uh, also, bidinai ta'ala, I would advise um, uh, that Muslim to learn the things that he needs to add, answer in the grave. The, the three questions that every Muslim is going to face. And of course, from the best of those books is al Rasul al of Ibn Abdul Wahhab Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now Ibn Abdul Wahhab Rahimahullah Ta'ala, obviously he came later on, and there are scholars who wrote volumes and volumes on Islam way before his time. But his book is simplified, it's easy, it's laid out, uh, and it's free from just you know, any problem. It's, it's, Inshallah, problem free. It's a very important book for any basic Muslim, let alone a student of knowledge. It's a very time. small book as well, like, I don't know, 10 pages or something, isn't it? Yeah, and there are even smaller versions than that, which is in English as well. Mm -hmm. Even smaller versions, okay? Another very important book is uh, Al Wajibat Al Mutahatimat Al Ma'rifa, Ala Kulli Muslimin Wu Muslima, and that's in English as well. And then there are certain things that are mentioned. Do you know the translation in English, that one? That? I don't know the title of it, but it is. It is in English, for sure. Yeah. It's been years ago, years since I've seen it. But these are basic books to learn yeah. the fundamentals of Islam and the obligation of knowledge. Like I said, purity of the philosophy. That's golden. That's mm. golden. And those values that you learn in the beginning of that book, they stick with you for the rest of your life. Al-ilmu qabl al-qawli wal amal. How much suffering do we face on a daily basis and ignoring that principle? Mm. Speak after you know. Do after you know. How many of us talk about ignorance? We think, we feel, we follow someone, and then we have problems. We do harm to ourselves and to others. All right? Of course, obviously, the basics of the Arabic language, inshallah ta'ala. But before that, Hisnul Muslim. The fortress of the Muslim is very important. Learn the adhkar of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Learn the adhkar of the Quran. And that goes back to what you said about the spirituality of seeking knowledge. Psycho-spiritual. Very important. Connect yourself to Allah all of the time. And if Allah is not protecting you with seeking knowledge, you can't be successful. And most importantly, is you have to develop your memory. And you have to learn and discover the magic of revision. You have to discover the magic of revision. And many of the pious predecessors, they would say, مُذَاكَرَةُ الْعِلْمِ حَيَاتُهُ the lifeblood of knowledge is revision. So how do you know the dhikr before you go to sleep so well? How do you know the dhikr before you drink? After you drink, you put it's in your shoes. It's a good thing you said that after the <laughs> Yeah, because you keep doing it. Yeah. So you have to train yourself that there is no mountain that's high enough to, too, too tall to climb if you just keep practicing it. Okay, revising knowledge is the, the lifeblood. That's the vertebrate of ilm. And you learn this through adhkar. Wallahi. Surah Al-Baqarah, you're trying to memorize it. Whoa, it's almost 300 ayat. There's, there's one ayat that's an entire page. It's intimidating. But when you keep reviewing it and reciting it in a prayer and teaching it to others, you learn it like that. So you get that tarbiyah and that mindset from the adhkar. Let alone the spiritual protection and the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, last but not least, is to learn the basics of the Arabic language, not the grammar but the vocabulary. And you take small bits and pieces of grammar to form basic sentences for conversational purposes. And many people, they start off with Adjurumiya, they start off with this Nahu book, and they, they go from Alphabet to Siba Way. And that's a huge mistake. <laughs> and that is also a means of being burnt out and finding the Arabic language to be too confusing and too difficult. You gotta learn how to talk, you gotta learn how to listen, you gotta learn how to conversate, okay? Um, tight. I don't want to tell you no more stories with regards to that. I think that's clear, inshallah. There's a book that I've, for beginners that I saw, which is quite nice. I'm not sure if you've come across it. It's called Al Kitab Al Asasi. Yes, 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 for sure. Mm -hmm. Would you, would yeah. you that one as a for, for a beginner? 
several, several. With the simplest and easiest, and even if it's a bigger book, just take the smaller portions of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, obviously, you studied Hadith at university, so that's your kind of area of specialism, is that correct? Alhamdulillah. I was fortunate, yeah. uh, fortunate enough to uh, go to the Prophet City for over a decade, or about a decade, roughly, um, and learn all of the Islamic sciences, most of them, a basic level from them, alhamdulillah. And uh, that was my major, yes, in the college, sciences of hadith, alhamdulillah. So one of the, the main talking points in terms of Islam, one of the things that we would consider a USP, in the sense that it's very unique to Islam, comparative to other religions, even according, compared to other histories, ancient histories, is the way that our tradition has actually been preserved. So could, mm -hmm. in a nutshell, if you like, or in a summarized version, way, tell us how has hadith been preserved and what is the um, importance of that? Clear, clear. Well, like you mentioned, not just for religion and faith, but also for history. Mm. There's no doubt about that. There are some uh, experts and specialists, they've done a lot of research with regards to the history of narration and the history of the chain of narration. Obviously, a hadith composed or is composed of a senate and a metem. There is the chain of reporters and the actual report. So some specialists, they have uh, tried to go into other religions, other faiths, and not just Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, also Hinduism, um, uh, the mainstream uh, religions, <laughs> some call the Abrahamic faiths, things like this, okay? Uh, and they've done research and they've looked to the extent of the usage of the chain of narration in those other religions and those other books. And there are, there are usages of, 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 of report. It's, there's, it's not. But there's never been a time, a place, a people, a religion in which the chain of narration played such a pivotal role, like the vertebrae in the body of that religion like Islam. Mm. There's never been a religion or a way or even a historical event because the history of the Arabs, the language of the Arabs, the culture of the Arabs is extremely and immensely indebted to Islam. Islam improved their history, the preservation of it, the report of it, their language, their letters, their speech, everything was polished by Islam. There's never been a time or place in a religion in which preservation and precaution and precision and such a mighty punishment has been placed on lying and fabricating and being inaccurate than Islam. There's no, there's no doubt about that. One of the non-Muslim Orientalists who studied Islam, uh, who attacked Islam vehemently, who was a student of one of the worst opponents of Islam was Joseph Schratt, a German Orientalist. And he made the famous statement, him. He said, if the Muslims could take pride in anything, it would be the science of hadith. Not poetry, the love of horses and this and that. He said, genealogy, if they could take pride in anything, it would be in one hadith. And he was an open, staunch opponent to Islam and to the hadith. But he acknowledged that. And we all know the Arabs have a famous statement, in al-fadla ma shahidat bihi al-a'da. Okay, true props, true regard comes from one's opponent. It's true recognition. Your opponent doesn't like you, he doesn't love you, but he respects you. And he takes off his hat. He bows to you and he says, I acknowledge you and your prowess. We were not friends. We're at odds with each other. But I definitely respect and acknowledge you as a person, as a, as a, as a, as a brave, fearless man. All right? So therefore, Ilm al-Hadith uh, is something which is very special. It's very unique. And uh, this is found in the Quran and Kareem, which Allah Azza wa tells us, Inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna luhu lahafiduna. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says that indeed we have sent down the dhikr and indeed we shall preserve it. And the dhikr initially means the Qur'an. It means the Qur'an. Allah says we have sent down the Qur'an and we will preserve the Qur'an. Now, there's one or two things that we can say now. Number one is, does this include the sunnah as well? As if the verse says, indeed we have sent down the Qur'an and sunnah and we will preserve them both. Or does it just mean that the Qur'an has been sent down and the Qur'an will be preserved? But the interpretation of the Qur'an, the understanding of the Qur'an, uh, the, the stories of the Qur'an, 
how can we even have any sense of the Quran without the Hadiths? And that which is a necessity of the Quran to be understood, practiced, implemented, reflected upon, also must be what? Preserved as well. It makes no sense for a person to have very expensive or costly spring water and he carries it in his hands. He says, I'm gonna take it from the spring and I'm gonna walk up on my trail or my bike. I'm gonna hold it in one hand. I'm gonna go in my house and I'm gonna take the spring water in my hands and in my jaws on a, like this. Only a fool would do that. The more expensive the water, the more pure and pristine the water, the vessel, the glass, the plastic, the box, whatever you preserve it in has to be just as what? Just as good, rather even more costly. And that's because the thing on the inside has to be preserved and kept safe. And if you don't have the outside that's preserved and kept safe, it's a waste of time. So Allah has so no doubt about that. He has sent down the Quran and he has inspired the Prophet Sallallahu and given him revelation as well. And the interpretation of that Quran, the understanding, the application, and like I said, very important word is the sense of the Quran. The Quranic stories, so many, Allah says, uh, Indeed, we see that your face is turning about, looking into the skies, looking into the heavens. We'll give you a direction of prayer that you'll be pleased with. What is the law talking about? Who is the law talking to? Who, who's turning their face in the sky? Anyone? Everyone? Who's looking into the heavens? What is the direction of prayer? What, what was the direction of prayer? What changed them from the Qibla in which they were facing? Who, who was praying? When? These questions can't be answered. Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us about the Prophet with Asar al Nabiyu that when the Prophet made a secret towards some of his wives, who's the Prophet? Yaqub, Shu'ayb, Idris, Ilyas, Dhal Kifl. Who, 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 who's the Prophet? And who are his wives? Is, there, is a man allowed to have more than one wife in Islam? Allah says some of his wives, was the divorced wife, who was the secret? How can you make sense of Surah Tahrim, chapter 33? Make sense out of it. Verse after verse, story after story that you cannot understand the beginning, the end, or the middle without the hadith, without the sunnah. So many people, when they talk about the preservation of the sunnah, we have to look at the preservation of the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is the starting point and is also the last frontier for the reality that the sunnah of the Prophet was preserved. And those who reject the hadiths and say that they do not exist, they're made up in their lives, they are non-Muslims. And they have rejected the Qur'an. They have rejected the Qur'an. And Allah clearly tells us, وَجَاهِدُهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادٍ كِبِيرًا Use the Qur'an and fight them with it strongly, okay, vigorously. So we don't have to get into this historical report, Ahad, Fulan, Bukhari, that's just deal with the Qur'an. You are a Qur'an rejecter, a Hadith rejecter, please make sense of the Qur'an. Make sense. If you can make sense, then I'll accept your argument that the Hadiths are all lies, they're all made up 250 years after the Prophet, no problem. But make sense out of chapter 33. Make sense out of this surah. Make sense out of this verse. When did the Prophet say, why does Allah says into the homes through the gates? Who is he talking to? What is he talking about? Who's Zaid? And the list goes on of problematic issues that they have no answer for except through the riwayah, the sunnah of the Prophet. So that's in brief. Second thing is, the Prophet Sallallahu the sunnah, just like the Quran, we don't believe that it's based off of just human effort. But there are things which are miraculous and there are things which are above and beyond the ability of the human to do. And that they are miraculous, miraculous. And if we lose sight of that, and if everything is just mundane and everything is just academic and everything is tangible, there lies no doubt we will lose our faith. And when we lose our faith, the game is over. There's nothing else to do afterwards. So we can't lose, we can't lose the scope of that. But of course, there are tangible reasons behind the sunnah being preserved in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But before we go that far, um, I don't want to take too much time. It's very important. Uh, we have to understand the power of prejudice and the power of racism and the power of a person feeling inferior and a person feeling superior to another race. And we have to understand that race, color, class, and nation these things are involved in every single aspect of life. Every sphere of life, including studies and academia. And there's not a time in which race and color and religion is separated from these other aspects of life. 
Listen to these words carefully. And from that is academic studies of Islam. For a person to come from another country and to travel thousands and thousands of miles, another part of the world, another climate, and to take 800, 900, 1,000 years of scholastics, of studies, of in-depth, futuristic, state-of-the-art, detailed studies, and to ignore them, neglect them, find fault of them, flaunt them, that is based off of racial superiority or inferiority. And that is the concept of Orientalism. That the Muslims, for over a thousand years, they had ulum al-Quran, ulum al-Hadith, usul al-Fiqh, all of these different sciences, and I came from Hungary. What was my country a thousand years ago? 800 years ago. What science and knowledge of astronomy did we have? Of hygiene, of, of this and that, the embryo, so many things. They were lost, stuck in darkness. And the Muslims had sprawling cities of libraries, based on Hikmah. Do you know how many volumes of books were burnt when the siege of Baghdad took place? Historians say that the, uh, the they, they say that the sea became black from ink. Millions and millions of books were lost. And other scholars, they debate that. And they say that the Mongol invaders did not burn Beit to Hikmah. That's the discussion. The point is, is that there's only one library in one city of Baghdad. The Muslims wrote thousands of volumes of books, not just on Islamic sciences as well. And for someone to come along and to say that these sciences are all flawed, they're all lies, they're all based off of political gains, sectarianism, Shia, Sunnah, Allah, he's doing that because of something. And it's not just pure scholastic or academic research, but it's because your way is flawed. And the reason why it's flawed is because you're Arabs, you're Berbers, you're Kurds, I'm European, I'm Hungarian, I'm German, our way is automatically superior to your way. And it's very sad and unfortunate that many Muslims have fallen victim to this and they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. And from the manifestations of this is the feeling that if something isn't written down, if something isn't documented the way we want it to be written down and documented, then it's automatically a lie and it's automatically false. And this is the main premise of those who say that the hadiths were not preserved because they weren't written down in the time of the prophet rather 200 even though years even though a lot a big part of western tradition all the way back to the times like when you talk about you know the iliad the, the iliad the homer's iliad and so on it's, it's all based on all for sure, for sure. Yeah. so that's and, and likewise even the torah is uh, the jews claim although we, they don't have a chain of narration which is, i'm sure you're going to talk about what what that entails but they claim it's oral so the the bedrock of um, Western society, which was Judo Christian values, was based on documents or books that claim to have been orally transmitted. Things like, like mm -hmm. the of um, Homer and uh, the uh, Old Testament itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right to say that this is this is very much the New Orientalist critique now. Is that well, these are Chinese whispers. You're talking about the Senate. These are actually uh, Chinese whispers. It's not a, a meticulous preservation mechanism. Um, uh, a lot of it wasn't compiled until uh, the third century. Uh, these are the kinds of things that maybe Orientalists, I think Shaft is actually one of them who, 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 who uh, said this, would say, they would say things like, so what makes your uh, method actually any better than uh, these other methods? Or why is it special? Why is it, why is it, why is it so unique? For sure, for sure, for sure. So that's a very excellent point. And ask the two coquet, of course, people attack someone of something that they're guilty themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, somebody will say, well, we aren't Orientalists. Orientalism is faded out. The colonial age is gone. But the Arabs, they say, in the Likuli Komen, or Likuli Komen Wadith. Someone is going to inherit. And these people in these modern academic uh, universities, they have inherited and they don't even realize it. So at the end of the day, to keep things brief, because that's a very long discussion, but I did want to shed light on that, is the foundation of that. And just yeah. because something is written doesn't mean that it's authentic. And just because something is orally passed down, it doesn't mean that it's a lie. Let alone the fact that there were countless hadiths written in the time of the prophet. I mean, countless I think a great example of that as well, just thinking off the top of my head, probably one of the best examples of that is language. Like sure. which in the beginning of early civilization, it was the way that language was transmitted 
was actually was, was transmitted orally. Moreover, mathematics itself is a language. I mean, people when they learned maths, they didn't necessarily depend on uh, the books. When they were learning, they were teaching each other from how they were taught. There's lots of things that basically we learn, even body language, the way we are taught and the way we speak and all of these things, a lot of it is totally transmitted. Most of the things you could, you could argue is transmitted through uh, generational mass transmissions and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone could argue what well, language evolves from that perspective. And that is the, the requirement here when you have, subhanAllah, like, you know, you're going to, inshallah, talk about this, uh, principles in place which stop, you know, uh, certain things from being changed, right? So in terms of now the hadith, what are the principles that are in place that would kind of ward off this Chinese whispers allegation? How do we, so if someone says, well, if someone says this, and uh, three or four centuries later, it's communicated as this, how do we know that it's not being changed along the way? Clear, for sure. Well, I think first and foremost is that we have to know who we're speaking with. Mm. Everyone is, uh, I mean, we, have to, we have to make a distinction of who we're talking to. Are we talking to a Muslim saying this? Or are we talking to a non-Muslim? Are we talking to a man, a person of faith and religion, whether they're Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, or someone who's an atheist or agnostic? Someone who just bases off of the nada, the material mundane things. Uh, and if we don't know who we're speaking with, then of course, we're not going to go too far. So who are we talking to? If a person accepts the Quran and they are a Muslim, they have doubt, they are sincerely concerned uh, about the hadiths and the sunnah, etc. It is a very simple answer. And first and foremost, we say to them, do you know everything about the Quran? Do you know everything about the Quran? Do you know everything? What sort of came down first? What sort of came down last? Do you know the, the way of the Quran being transmitted? Of course, the average Muslim, the average student of knowledge is going to say, of course I don't. So what makes you uh, so demanding and what makes you so imposing that you have to know every meticulous detail about the Hadith tradition? This is a serious question now. And it's not running from the answer, but it's a serious question now. If you can't answer that, then obviously your questions about the Hadith aren't, yani, where are you going? We can sit down and talk about the Quran. You don't know everything about the Quran, and much of the Quran and your faith in it is based off of blind faith. So many people, they are very ignorant of the sciences of the Quran, which are sciences, but they want to be masters of Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. They want to be masters of the Hadith, Muwatta, and this Musnad, and that obviously that makes no sense. That makes no sense. And one of the most important principles of teaching someone and uplifting and raising from them doubts is to show them their ignorance. You have to be shown their ignorance. And that it's not about embarrassing someone or playing someone, but it's to show you that you need to humble yourself. And most people who talk about hadiths being false, they're blindly following someone and they're very haughty and arrogant. And they're telling you, this is not true for over 300 years. Who said that? Where are you getting this from? For over 300 years, the hadiths weren't written down. That's not true. That's a lie. So I think we have to show the people their ignorance and take it back to their faith of the Quran. How does the law tell us to go back to something which is totally false? There's not one single verse in the Quran in which Allah tells us to obey him and only him. Not one verse in the Quran in which Allah says, well, I'll tell you Allah, that's it. Not once. Every single time Allah tells us to obey him, immediately afterwards, it is and the messenger and his messenger. Rather, there are some verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to obey only the prophet, only the messenger and not Allah. That's deep. And it's profound. How could Allah tell us to obey someone whose words are lost and made up? And everything is fa uh, fallacy. Everything is, you know, just a tradition. So make sense out of the Quran. Tell me about the Quran, all of the signs of the Quran. And then be the next hour, hopefully, then I'll tell you about the hadiths and the sunnah. And until you can do that, you're being hypocritical and you're not sincere. As far as if it's a non-Muslim, then it goes back to what I previously said. What are your standards of academia or scholastic criticism are you supposing something and as most of the criticism levied against the hadiths people يعني, they're making فرضيات. we don't think it's like this in most cases it's most likely it's most likely it's most likely secondly is, is that let's actually look at the criticism so let's make an example of this now so people they say that the hadiths were used for political gain we had Muawiyah and we had Ali. 
So therefore, the easiest way of legitimizing someone's authority, someone's uh, uh, power of state is through the prophet. I am the prophet's nephew. I'm the prophet's cousin. I'm the prophet's relative. I am from the prophet's uncle, Abbas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, they say that the hadiths were made up because of the sectarian wars between Banu Umayya and Banu Abbas. Right. So therefore, that's their premise, is that due to the fact that there's doubt, there's reasonable doubt, there was a need for the Shia to legitimize themselves. There was a need for the Sunnis to legitimize themselves and to consolidate power, right? No problem. So you're telling me that if someone abuses a science and uses a science for their cause or their agenda or their propaganda, then the science automatically becomes false and made up and fabricated? Are you telling me that? If that's your premise, then there goes science, mathematics, navigation, religion, Christianity, Judaism, because all of these different sciences and these different books, they were used to monopolize people, people's lives, people's wealth, people's territory. So therefore, science is false because someone, a scientist came and he proved why it's okay to kill this minority and to make a genocide against these people and a holocaust against these people. Would you accept that premise? Of course they wouldn't. Rather, they have faith in those sciences, even though people for centuries have misused them and abused them. But the hadiths are automatically made up, fabricated, because someone supposedly abused them. The Shia used them against the Sunni. The Sunnis used them against the Shia. Muawiyah's people used it against Ali's people, Ali's people. So that's false. That's first and foremost. Second is, uh, the Prophet uh, he gave us the guiding principles upon which Western academia is based on. And that is precision. That is precaution. That is integrity. Equity. Okay? And that is research. And that is meticulous detail. And so many of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hadith, he himself, he laid down these values in which Western academia was nothing to be mentioned at the time. There was no such thing as Oxford or Cambridge when they traveled from country to country and they met 30 muhaddiths and 40 muhaddiths for one narration and verified. And, and the list goes on of the meticulous criticism that was laid down. Yeah. Whether you agree with it or not, no problem. Over a thousand years, no problem. But for you to just come and say that is haphazard collage and statements and actions put together, that's a problem, all right? And that comes from, in my personal opinion, in my studies, that comes from the racial superiority complex and the racial inferiority complex, is that our way is superior in all aspects, and your ways are inferior in all aspects. And that itself is a lie. We learn that from history. Many of the sciences of the West were stolen and borrowed from the East. And, uh, and it's not just about Jew, Muslim, Christian. We're talking about Masons. Everything is based off of the East and ancient Egypt and those, those countries. So that was the source of all of their guidance and all of their knowledge and all of their science. So the point, the point that I'm trying to get to is, is that who are we talking to? Someone of science? Let's talk about science. Someone of, uh, who's supposed to be an academic? Let's discuss academia now. But not what I think and I feel. And not with accusations, but with actual documentation, actual proof. And not what glorifying. Saying is, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. You're, so what you're, to kind of summarize what you're saying. What you're saying is that, look, just because something can or has the propensity uh, to be used uh, in a way which is uh, fitting to their own agenda, it doesn't mean that the principles or the, the actual ilm or the fen or the science itself, it becomes corrupt. For example, you gave the example of science. You said, uh, let's, let's take the example, the historical example of eugenics. So the fact that it sure. would justify... Um, racial programs against uh, certain groups of people, Jewish people, etc. doesn't mean now that science has become a corrupt enterprise. It just, just because it's been used in that capacity, it doesn't mean it, it, it has become a corrupt enterprise uh, sure. principally, right? So you're saying the same thing now that with Hadith, that it can be used like anything else. It can potentially be used in a, in a wrong way, in a, in a corrupting way. However, it doesn't mean that the principles, the guiding principles themselves are corrupt. It doesn't follow. That's what you're saying. So non I'm sure. A yeah. thousand percent. And rather, rather the hypocrisy of the whole argument. And I'm trying to make, I'm trying to place, place focus on Goldsire. Okay. Ignaz Goldsire. He's the founding father of supposed academic criticism of Islam and traditional Islam. And obviously, Somebody's going to say, well, we're not Orientalists. Orientalism, they have faded out. They have, they're extinct, but they aren't extinct. And most uh, academic institutions, they glorify this man. They glorify him. And his, uh, his 
suggestions, his reservations, and his, uh, the results of his research, to this day, most of them have been accepted. So we are firm believers in striking the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. We're not going to run after 50 sheep. Take out the shepherd, the sheep will disperse. So let's attack the heart of the whole entire I argument. That's a, that's a line from, um, was it 50, uh, was it? <laughs> the, the, the 50. It's older than that. I mean, it's older <laughs> than all the power. But that's, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. The 50 rules to power or something like this. 48. 48. 48 yeah. rules to power. Is it? That's one yeah. of the things. That's, 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 you've been, you've been trying to become a megalomaniac yourself. Yeah, nah, the state has been around for <laughs> Robert Green. So the point is, yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. You mentioned eugenics. People don't even realize that the catastrophes that took place in Eastern Europe were based off of eugenics. And there was a scientific justification right. for the crimes that were committed and supposedly committed, so on and so forth. It was a scientific justification. Yeah. And you look at this man as being a lunatic or a madman, but to him, he said, I'm following the way of nature. So just because someone abuses something or uses something for his gain, how can that make the whole entire science made up and false? Obviously, yeah. that, that's not sensible. That's not far from being academic. Let's bring forward, maybe for, to, to make the viewers kind of touch what it is we're talking about um, in more explicit terms. Can you give us an example of like a Senate? You talked about the chain of narration, right? How do, just, just to give people kind of a taste of what we're talking about when we're talking about the Very Senate, chain of narration. Yeah. The Senate is between you and the information. And before right. I give you a specific chain of narration, we have you and the actual report. So if I'm watching the news, we yeah. say that someone died in a very bad um, a train derailment. Train was derailed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was hundreds of miles away from the train derailment. I was in my home. I didn't see it. I didn't hear it directly. I'm far from it. But I'm getting the news. So between me, I'm on my living room sofa, and the derailed train and the hundreds of people that died, there has to be a chain. And that chain is, let's say, the uh, train conductor survived the crash or an eyewitness. And then the eyewitness or the, 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 the train conductor, he signaled for the emergency. And then the ambulance came. And then from the ambulance, the police came and the firefighters came. And then the news outlets came. And then it's broadcasted to my living room. So between me and the train being derailed and the people losing their lives in that horrible accident, there are people between me, middlemen, mediums. So that is the chain, the Senate. And the train being derailed, 500 people lost their lives. It was a horrible accident. That's the metan. That's the actual wording. That's the text. That's the actual story. So therefore, between me and that, obviously the news can't come from thin air. It can't come from a dream. It can't come from a hallucination. It must come from something mahsus, tangible, tangible. All right? So in Islam, between us, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is over 1,400 years. We didn't meet him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We would love to meet him, but we did not meet him physically. And we, we, we hope that we meet him in the hereafter, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we didn't meet him physically. So therefore, between us and him, there are people, there are men or women. Who are those men and women? That is called the Senate, the Isnan, the chain of reporters. Mm -hmm. And obviously, um, we're not going to have 100 people, 200 people between us and the Prophet. It's just too long. But between us and the hadith collectors, those who compiled the narrations, put them in a book, in a canon, between the author of the canon and the prophet himself, there is the chain. So, an so how example, many people would be in that chain, would you say? Maybe three, four? The, the least is going to be three to five. Okay. Three to five. An example of like, uh, of a senate that goes... Bukhari, rahimahullah, yeah. in his uh, sahih, he has several... Um, Hadiths that are only three people between him and the Prophet. So right. an example of this, many examples, Imam al-Bukhari, he has a shit. So he says, Hadathana Ali ibn Abdullah. Ali ibn Abdullah is his teacher. Bukhari was a student of him. Ali ibn Abdullah, he got it from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who was his teacher. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he got it from a man whose name is uh, Amr ibn Dinar, al-Makki. Amr ibn Dinar, he took it from Jabir, the son of Abdullah who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Ibn Abbas, as an example. Imam al-Bukhari narrates from Abdullah bin Yusuf, from Imam Malik. Imam al-Bukhari, he narrates from Abu al-Yaman, okay? He narrates from Shu'ib, from Zuhri, ETC. So we're dealing with history. Imam al-Bukhari died in the middle of the third century. 
and the Prophet Ali Salam, obviously it's almost 200 years, over 20 years between him and his what? Death. So therefore, Imam al-Bukhari is going to have his teacher, okay? And then his teacher's teacher, and then his teacher's teacher, the companion and the Prophet. So those names that you read, the first chain, Abdullah ibn Yusuf, Ali ibn Abdullah, Abu Yaman, whoever the Sheikh Imam al-Bukhari is, that is Bukhari's teacher. And it's going to be either two more or three more men or women between Imam al-Bukhari and between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Clear on this or not? Yeah. So Imam al-Bukhari says, Hadathan Abu Yaman, qal akhbarna shu'aymun, an al-zuhri qala akhbarani Abu Ubaid, Mawla Abdul Rahman bin Awfin, an Abu Harir sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yaqul, lan ila akhir al-hadith. So those four men, Abu Yaman, Shu'aib, Zuhri, Abu Ubaid, and Abu Huraira. And at other times, it was only four men, or three men, or two men and one woman. That's the Senate. And that's the actual chain. And those are actual names from Sahih al-Bukhari. So uh, something that we got to clear up, though, Sheikh, is many people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they think and they feel that the hadiths have only been preserved and the only way of uh, grading and critiquing hadiths is the Isnad. And this is extremely erroneous. Rather, the criticism of the text takes precedence over the criticism of the metan. Right. al metan, muqaddam ala naqtul sanat. So the text, people, they talk about the isnad, the isnad, the isnad, which is important. That's the backbone, like we said. But it's not the only way. Rather, the earliest scholars of hadith, they never differentiated between the sanat and the metan. There's one thing, riwayah. That's the reward. Can you can you touch upon that? So if something which is clearly contradictory, right, to the Quranic discourse, is that something that would be rejected in the early days then? There lies no doubt. But that's never ever going to happen. There's never been an authentic report that which clearly clashes against the Quran. Rather, rather, and this, this goes back to my previous principle, is that there are many ayats, countless ayats, that seem to be contradictory. And the scholars of Islam, they have a systematic, scientific way of removing the supposed contradiction and clash. So the ishkal is not specific to hadiths. There are several ayat which are mushkila, several. Well, I'll give you an example. Like, you know, in Sahih Muslim, there's the hadith of Turab, where the Adam was created from Friday and um, on Friday by, by the... Clear, clear, clear. Uh, and clear. what I was reading one time was um, some criticism of Dara Qutni and uh, Bukhari even, he was saying that this seems to contradict the narrative of the mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. the life of it, they weakened it. So is this the contextual... Uh, yes, it is. It yeah. is a correct rule, but it has to be used properly. Yeah, and we would not use it now. We would depend upon the usage of the early the scholars who already done that, that process. Of course, of course. But the science of interpretation is one of the most important sciences of Islam. Right. And that is also applied to the Quranic verses themselves mm. with regards to the creation of the heavens and earth. So what did Allah just make first? The heavens, the earth, were the trees, were the mountains placed there? There's, there's discrepancy with regards to that in the Quran itself. Mm. Allah yeah, I've seen some discussion in, uh, among the Mufassirun, like for example, Ibn Abbas, seems to say that the heaven was created first, but then Qatada says, no, the earth, uh, sorry, sorry, Ibn Abbas is the earth, and then um, Qatada says the heaven because of well, and, there, and, there, and there is a proper way of understanding that. And yeah. there's a proper way of bringing harmony, and the same applies to the authentic hadiths. However, yes, mm. uh, you, you, what you're asking about is that which is called Mawazina uh, Naqt. Yeah. Oh, Adawat Naqt. Is it proper for me to criticize the authenticity of a hadith because it supposedly clashes with the Quranic narrative. Yes, that is one of the styles. Mm. And also history. And also other authentic hadiths. And also even common sense. But that's mm. not for every person and every person's fancy. And every hasty person who just wants to find fault and say that it's fabricated. And if you, you take that, if, if you take that, if you take that approach, like I said, that will lead you to rejecting the what? The Quran itself. That's right. I was going to say a lot of people don't realize the, um, this beautiful ilm or this very sophisticated uh, science, which is referred to as ilm or rijal, 
or the idea of the science of men, the biography of the biographies of men, uh, which it, which is an incredible complement to this whole standard system that you're talking about. And so much as not only now do you have this system, but you have people who are literally MI5 checked, if you want to go FBI checked, everyone will have their biographies and so on. As mm -hmm. I think if those individuals meet the criterion required in order to be transmitters of the hadith, that's something which is not as rigorous in, in Western historical discourse. Can you touch upon the placement of Al-Burjah uh, al these kinds of concepts of um, kind of uh, biography, biographies of men. How do we, oh, it's not only men, obviously, as we know, it's, it's women as well. But how do we use this in order to to kind of uh, do tanqih or rough Clear. Of Well, I mean, let, let, let's like you said, let's talk about the countries in which we live, Western societies. We yeah. talk about uh, criminal law. You mentioned MI5, FBI, CIA, all of these different things. How many people in America are named John? Mm. Tracy, Michael, how many last names are there? Smith, <laughs> William, Ke Muhammad, Abdullah, countless. And they have a sophisticated system of differentiating between this one from that one. Fingerprints, eye recognition, date of birth, middle name, and the list goes on. The Muslims were doing this in the third century, the second century, the fourth century, when the West was considered to be Spain in the Iberian Peninsula, Andalusia. That was it, that was the West. West was Cordoba, there was no such thing as the new land, new found land. There was no Iceland and Greenland, there was no America, according to those people, okay? So, El Murijal, no doubt about that, is one of the greatest contributions to human society. And one of the biggest feats in the history of the humankind. And that is the science to precisely, uh, systematically look after, categorize, separate, combine names of thousands upon thousands of men and women, different tribes, different races, different lineage, different genealogy, and classifying them. So therefore, if we try to discredit Ibn Rajal or look at it as something which is a footnote or something which is extremely faulty and flawed, then our Western societies are also flawed and useless. Okay, why am I being harassed in the airport right now? Oh, we thought you were someone else. We thought you were a different person. How is that? My passport number is not the same as him. My name is not spelled M-O, it's M-U. They're not being honest. They're not telling the truth. And when they want to pinpoint someone and follow someone, they know what? Exactly how to do it. And Allah's no doubt that is, they have been inspired from the Muslims' efforts. So that's first and foremost. Secondly is, when you study Ilm al-Hadith, Mustafa al-Hadith, there's so many rules that pertain to names, nicknames, by names, surnames, tribes, um, of a person was manumitted, they used to be a slave. There's so many different detailed points of making sure that this person is not that person. Al-Muttafiq wal-Muftariq, Al-Muttalif wal-Muhtalif, Al-Mutashabih, Al-Wuhdan, Al-Mafarid, Al-Majahil, okay? Man, uh, man al-Shahra bi kunyati dun asmihi, uh, man nusibi ila ghayri aba'i ila akhirihi. That in itself is a whole, yani chunk, a chunk, slice of ilm al-Hadith and ilm al-Mustalah is the precision of the names and the people and making sure that we don't jumble and mix people. That this is a John Smith, and that's also a John Smith. And they may have the same middle name. It may come from the same uh, um, city or town in England, but they're two different people. They're two different individuals. One is a liar, one's trustworthy. One met this person, one didn't meet this person. So that in itself is an endless sea of envy. And those who actually want to study it and want to find it, realize no doubt the books are available. And I, I would tell you this, that Ilm al-Hadith is... The more you study it, the more you're humbled by it. You're humbled by it. And um, I think that one of the reasons, uh, in my answer to this, I think, me personally, for my own studies, and Allah knows best, one of the reasons why uh, the Western critics uh, made such uh, heavy claims against the, the Muslims and the sciences of the Muslims, of course, there's race. They have other agendas and, and aims. But one of the reasons is because it was just so marvelous, as if it was unbelievable. How could one man memorize this much? How could one man travel this long? How could one person do this? How could one man have the ability to, it's, it's impossible. It has to be a lie. It has to be fabricated. 
and that goes back to society and culture. Our society and our culture, everything is written down. Everything is recorded. Everything is documented. You'll find someone in other societies in which nothing is written down, nothing is documented. And you call them savages, or you call them they are behind, they're prehistoric. But you ask them about this trade, and about this craft, and about this location. You ask them about this direction, and you will be shocked how sharp their memory is. Okay, and this is something which is uh, very important in um, American history. I'll give you a brief example of this. Uh, there's a true story of a man, I don't know if you've studied his life, named Cochise. Oh, Cochise was a very, very, very important uh, leader of the uh, Chiricahua Apache Indians, or uh, natives, obviously people that use the term Indian, politically incorrect. Uh, and the Apaches here, they were considered to be the last, the last of all of the, uh, the longest uh, war in the United States history, the Indian Wars, to hold out from the occupation. Uh, and they refused to be placed on reservations. They refused. They just, they just, they refused. So this man named, his name was Cochise. And Cochise here, um, he was a great leader of his people. Uh, and there was an American soldier or an ex-American soldier. He was tired of the lies. He was tired of the bloodshed. He was tired of the oppression and the wrong that was being done on both sides. And he said, I want to talk to this man Cochise directly. I want to talk to him directly. And they say, you're crazy. He'll kill you. He'll skin you. He'll do this. He'll do this. He says, I want to talk to him. I want to explain to him how there can be a peace between the settlers and between the natives. So obviously they said, well, he's a savage. He's an Indian. He walks barefooted. He has bows and arrows. We have the U.S. Cavalry. We'll be done with him in three months. We'll eradicate the lands from them, and they'll be on a reservation. So he said, well, he maybe, maybe he doesn't walk with shoes. Maybe he can't read and write. Maybe he doesn't know how to use this instrument, so on and so forth. He says, but him and his scouts, they know every single pathway in the entire state of Arizona. There's not a hill. There's not a well. There's not nothing that they don't know by heart. And you use maps and compasses. And you have to have scouts. And you get lost and so on and so forth. So the point that I'm trying to get to is, is that it's about culture. Someone who writes something versus someone who memorizes something. You understand? Not to drift from the point. Okay, uh, someone who understands something the natural way is no less inferior than someone who uses a computer or an instrument. Unless we're basing it off of I'm superior to you and you're inferior to me. And that's Ilmu Rijal. So Ilmu Rijal was something that many people, they didn't consider it to be true. They considered it to be a lie. It had to be made up. There's no way one man can memorize this much. And that's because they came from societies in which everything was pen in, pad pen and paper. What do you mean you found your way from one island to the next without a compass? What do you mean you didn't use this type of navigation? What do you mean you found your way from one hill to another valley? That's impossible. You're lying. It's impossible for you. And that's because you were trained to use a compass. You're trained to use a map. You're trained to use this instrument. And this man who has no shoes, who's walking barefooted, he has all of that what? Naturally. So, so that, that's how we have to understand Ibn Rijal is that it's a tremendous, amazing feat, and it isn't some mystical science either, as many people think. It's no mystical science. It's tangible. It's practical. It's tangible and it's practical. And animal hadith is not a mystical science. It's a tangible and practical science. But just because something is beyond your grasp and beyond your limit and beyond your culture, it does not mean that it is false and fabricated and spurious. That's the point. It's a good point, and I think that this is a very um, pertinent point especially considering the fact that we're living in a society that's become obviously hyper-tech, you know, it's just hyper-technological uh, society and stuff like that. And so it's become less and less conceivable for people now in our cultural paradigm that, oh, this is, um, this could be done. Like you just mentioned, it's a beautiful example that especially in the past that people will be memorizing names and that they'll know their tribal lineage and that they'll know what their fourth cousin is or their fourth paternal great auntie was named and all of these things that was standard knowledge for a human being living in say Arabia at that time now it's completely it's, it's, it's redundant knowledge it's not it's not used knowledge. it's not in the air and so people find it more, and more difficult to that things would have been memorized in this way that exact words and phrases would have been exactly understood and so on and so forth so that that, that is what Clifford Pitt actually referred to, the sociologist, um, 
important sociologists refer to as a thick description. Is that in order for you to make a judgment of society, you need a description of it. And, and it's, it's this problem of um, kind of imposing cultural paradigms on other ancient and medieval paradigms uh, that causes the, like the gap of information. I think you're absolutely right. But what I wanted to ask you now, I think, uh, which is an interesting segue, because we talk about Jarrah Tadil and the idea of, because the idea of Jarrah Tadil, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is the idea of making criticisms, like historical criticisms against the character of individuals such that history would not be accepted from them. And it was done for, or on the other hand, Tadil is actually saying that the, the just nature of this individual and the fit nature of them to be able to transmit uh, history. This science is now unfortunately being used by uh, youngsters and by people who are trying to learn the religion, by people like, you know, uh, on the extreme side of um, people who claim to be Salafis and so on and so forth, in order to attack their companions and to attack their colleagues and to attack Mashaykh and uh, ulama and to, to uh, in the guise of trying to protect the religion and preserve it in the same way as it was in the early days. Where is the um, the fallacy in this. I mean, where have they gotten this from? Or is, of course, this something that they've just done for their own agenda? Clear, clear. Very important question. Um, no doubt about that. Living in the United States, uh, I, from the East Coast, I can relate to this personally, no doubt. What well, I'll say first and foremost is we have to understand that uh, I don't know who exactly, mm. but I do believe that there is someone or there are people who have an intentional design to spread confusion among the Muslims. Yeah. And I don't believe that it is a conspiracy theory. In my heart, it's a fact, and Allah knows best, yeah. Yeah. is that there is a person or persons who are yeah. systematically and have systematically created things, made things, made ways, لِنَشْرِ mm. الْفَوْضَى to make things worse than what they already are with the Muslims. Yeah. And to spread confusion, mislead people, Take people's rights, wealth. I didn't say that, but I said what? Nashrul Fulda. Spread confusion. And in Allah's no doubt, this is one of their strongest tools. So the fact or the idea that I have someone who never studied, I have someone who barely has studied the Arabic language, I have yeah. someone who has barely uh, learned the Quran, the basics of his recitation, I have someone who is uh, of amateuristic strategy, we say. Amateuristic. Mm. He is now the master of Jarhu Tadil and Ilm al -Rijal. He now determines who's just and who's unjust, who's equitable, who's disparaged. He now determines who to listen to, who to watch, who to take from. He now determines who's going to paradise, who's not, whom Allah has mercy upon, whom Allah does not have mercy upon. He now determines who's qualified to speak and teach on Islam. That's a joke, obviously. It's a laughing stock. If you were that concerned about Islam and the Sunnah and Hadith and Aqeedah and the way of the Salaf, you would have left the UK and you would have studied. Yeah. That's first and foremost. You, you would have left America and you would have studied. And you wouldn't have studied for two, three years. You would have stayed there for a very long time. You would have accomplished things. You would have been evaluated if you would have had that much ghayrah upon Sunnah and Deen and Aqeedah. Let alone become a master of other men. And you haven't mastered yourself yet. So that's first and foremost, we don't have to go any further by saying that it's a laughing stock, it's a joke, okay? It's a masrahiyah, as they say, paragos, yani puppets. It's a joke, shadow yeah, puppet, shadow puppet. It's a joke, okay? okay you yeah. can't be serious, Aki. You cannot be serious, okay? So that's first and foremost. Uh, Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, Imam Ahmed, all of the ulama of hadith, um, they considered someone who didn't travel, who didn't leave their country, who didn't go out and face the arduous challenges, the pain, the rigorous, rigorous challenges of Rihla, they wouldn't even consider him to be of anything worth mentioning. Imam Ibn Ma'in, he says, Arba'atun la minhum rushdan. He says, four people you can expect no good from. Period. There's no good that's going to come from these four people. And from those four people they mention, وَرَجُلٌ يَكْتُبُ الْحَدِيثَ بِبَرَدِهِ is the man who writes down hadiths in his own country and he doesn't travel to other countries. And Ibn Ma'in, Imam Ahmad, Ibn Ibn Baghdad, that was the center of civilization. The Sumerians, the Assyrians, before Islam, 
let alone Islam. That was the cradle of civilization, Mesopotamia. Let alone Islam, Hadith, Aqid, that was all in Baghdad. And they said, if you don't leave Baghdad, and you didn't go to Kufa, and Basra, and Wasit, if you don't go to the Hijaz, if you don't go to the Masjid, so on and so forth, then you will not be successful if you don't go out and seek Hadith from other than your town and your city. So what would they say about someone who never even studied in their city, who doesn't live and didn't live in Baghdad? So before we go further and defending and arguing, we say that it is a joke. It's a joke. It's a laughing stock. You're not a student of knowledge, let alone an imam, let alone an alim, let alone someone who's qualified to speak about the honor of other people and the integrity of other people. So I would say that it stops there. If you have not studied, you have not traveled, you haven't went anywhere for years out of your life systematically, keep silent. Don't talk about ilm hadith. Don't talk about a Muslim's honor because this Muslim was starving and suffering and you were in the UK eating fish and chips. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's what's interesting about it is that a lot, I mean, the faulty reasoning, I mean, to be explicit here, is that they, for example, I'm giving an example here, they'll use a sheikh like Sheikh Rabbi al Madkhali, they'll say he praised us, okay, so this is a praise system. So now they've given it upon them to where the true Salafis for the sake of argument. And what we're going to do is we're going to determine for you guys, the public, where yeah. you said is the one on the haq. Who, and who is the one on the bottle? Who is the one on the truth? And who is the one on the falsehood? Mm -hmm. that are, are being given money. Uh, like S pubs, we have several publications in the UK. You have Troy in America. You have figureheads like Abu Khadija. You have uh, Abu Ayyad. And you have, uh, you know, Musa Richardson and these individuals. And Hassan and Somali and, and so on. And they are now, they've taken the mantle, not, not just to go to the scholars and claim. But to actually pronounce tabdiyah on other individuals, they'll say, you're an innovator. Your adala is lost. Your adjustment is lost. And this has, and this is the problem with it, it has such far-reaching effects that it can stop marriages from taking place. It can actually cause divorces. It can, it can be a, a segue to divorce. It can cause family discord, a communal crash. All of this fawda that you refer to, the chaos that it's referring to, uh, and it's obviously stopping people from listening and benefiting from individuals who, uh, who, who are trying to call to Islam, who are not part of their own cult or their own group or whatever it is. And so this is all built upon a praise system, okay, that we've gotten this praise from this sheikh. But in fact, those in the same individuals, uh, many of which I've named their names, haven't studied Arabic language. They can't communicate in the Arabic language. They can't even speak Arabic. They can't read the Quran. Abu Khadija cannot read the Quran. For he cannot read the, the, you know, the actual Quran. And this, Abu Ayyad can't speak in, in a conversational Arabic uh, way. And now they're, they're taking it upon themselves to write PDFs and do this and that, uh, trying to uh, take away the honor of Muslims. So does it, where do they get the confidence, delusions of grand jaw, where do they get the confidence to, to do this kind of thing? Well, I guess Islam, uh, Salafi, or the way of the Salaf is the praise of a sheikh. That's it. Yeah. That's what it is. Quality, content, ilm, knowledge. No. Sheikh Fulan praises us. Us. That's it. But they wouldn't take. They wouldn't accept the standard for a uh, sheikh. I mean, if you went to a doc, if you went to a doctor, right, and you said, "Well, this this this, um, uh, this doctor praised me," but did you go through the process of learning? No. Is that that's not important. Medicine, the science of medicine, rather, the doctor who prays you, he himself is a doctor. Right. Right? He, he's legitimized through what? Through being a what? A doctor. Yeah, he's, yeah. Okay, he studied, right? So I think um, that's the best way of looking at it is, is that is the way of the Salaf of Salih, is it just the praise, the supposed praise of one scholar? Right. If it is. If that's, if that's what Islam is and the Sunnah and the way of the Salaf, Imam Muhammad, if that's what it is, then there's no discussion between us and them. Mm. If that's what you think and feel, then there's literally there's nothing to talk about. And if that's not the case, then I think you should sit down and reinvestigate your theory now. We yeah. are upon guidance because Sheikh Balan spoke of us. He spoke well of us. And because he was praised by this alim, and then this alim was praised by that alim, now it trickles down to the UK, and we're now the masters of Ilm al-Rijal, supposedly, Jarhu Tadil, supposedly, and we can push out who we want and pull in who we want. If that's what you honestly think and feel, 
there lies no doubt you're living in a great state of illusion and delusion. Okay, to think that that that's how it works. All right, and then there, there's so many different ways of looking how, at, the, at the fallacy of this. But once again, if 20 years of study, 15 years of study, scholastic achievements, if all of them are ignored and distinct because of one general vague praise of one item, then I would say, tafaddal. Go ahead. Can't argue, can't argue with that, can you? <laughs> it's, not, it's nothing to say. If that's yeah. what you consider the way of guidance, Imam Ahmed, Ilm Rijal, Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Abu Dawood, if they consider one general vague ta'deel of one alim to be enough for a narrative, the fun mm. Go ahead, you got it. I mean, it, che it cheapens the enterprise, doesn't it? I mean, it, che it cheapens the entire enterprise for them to think that a single praise, a good word. It's, well, I, I think that it's, it's extremely disrespectful to knowledge. That's right. And I think that um, the people who claim to love knowledge and love the scholars, they themselves are extremely disrespectful to the scholars. Mm. Extremely disrespectful from so many different aspects. And from those aspects, or someone of no type of scholastic background to be attached to someone of a scholastic background. How is this your representative in the West? Right. It's shameful. And I'm not saying this to disrespect any scholar. And I'm not mm. saying this to speak bad of any scholar. But this is a reality. It's a harsh reality. Yes, How yes. is this person your deputy, your representative, and this person has not made any formal studies in Islam? I myself, my Six, humble knowledge, 60 years know old almost, and he doesn't know how to read the book. I don't, I, I, I don't comprehend that. Yeah. I don't comprehend that. Yeah. And how someone who is the, yani, the least achieved scholastically to be the leader, mm -hmm. I don't understand well, that. I find really, I mean, I wouldn't, if I had a marital problem, I wouldn't take my, I mean, I wouldn't do it like, you know, as someone who can't read the Quran. I mean, I, I would find it very scary to find that this is the At least, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Say the least. There's so many different problems with that whole entire argument and premise. But mm. what I'm doing right now is focusing on have we imitated those people? The mm. Prophet Sallallahu says, Women to Shabbah be common for women. And most people they understand the hadith in a negative sense. Whoever imitates the people, he's from them, good and bad. So mm. are we actually copying and imitating Imam Ahmed, Ibn al Madini, Sufyan al Thawri? Mm. Are we? Are we being like them? They sought knowledge. How can a person claim to love the Salaf al-Salih and he is opposed to the foundation of the Salaf al-Salih, which is ilm, which is talab, which is rihla? And how can any scholar approve and allow this person to bear his name and his legacy in Western countries? And like you said, marriage, divorce, masjids, all types of affairs, it doesn't stop. And which a person has the full monopoly I determine who gets married, who gets divorced. I determine what match it opens, what match it does not open. How can you allow someone who's, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to say anything bad about anyone, but how can you allow someone who has no scholastic achievements represent you? Mm. I find that personally extremely problematic. And it's, extremely it's, problematic. it's the way they come across, it's the way they, they reach their conclusions as well. It's just, for example, I, I, I'm not sure if I heard this from you, one of your lectures, that you were saying that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about He didn't put caveats in place. He didn't say anything except this and except that. He says, and hold firm to the rope of Allah and, uh, and you know, don't become divided. But if, if I came on, if I came on or yourself, we came on right now and we said, let's hold all the Muslims should hold on to the rope of Allah and not be divided. You can expect resistance from this group. Immediately. Media yeah, resistance, yeah. and one of the well, reasons I mean, behind that is, and a lot of that. Yeah, yes, I mean, how does that? How does that, Muslims, how does that work? The unification of the Muslims, the strength of the Muslims, is not the objective. Yeah. Rather, the objective is to weaken the Muslims, and to make them further separated, and to spread further chaos. Do you think is there a parallel there? Like you know, the, the, this might sound conspiratorial, but you know, the, the American government's uh, bid to try and, well, some, some argue, uh, put black people all in one community and equip them with weapons to, to, to kind of, um, and create these kind of gang uh, violences, black and black crime, all that kind of thing. Divide and conquer, let them all kill themselves kind of thing. Let them uh, destroy themselves. Is there a parallel between that approach and this approach with these? Uh, uh, with there are no accidents. Hmm. There are no coincidences. 
There lies no doubt about that. There are no accidents and there are no coincidences. Where did these things come from? Who supports them? And like you just said, that is the backbone of their legitimacy. Sheikh Fulan mm -hmm. has praised us. Why did he praise you? Yeah. And what was the extent of his praise? And what was the detail of his praise? And does his praise override other things from Quran, from Sunnah, from Hadith, from consensus, or other scholars disparaging you? Mm. So why? Just ask ourselves, and what has happened? Like we'll see Allah our best. What is the, and there are many, there are many, yeah. there are many. Before and after, there are many, there are many. Yeah. And the point is not to pit scholar against scholar. That's what, that's what they do. That's not the point. The yeah. point is that what is the fruit and the result? Yeah. What's the fruit and the result? And very important point is, is that who is being refuted? Who is being attacked? People of clear innovations? Clear misguidance? Clear kufa? Are those the people or are there others? So I have no doubt in my heart, and Allah knows best, is that there are people who don't want good for the Ummah. Yes. And they want further division, further separation, and then they try to justify and Islamify their dark intentions by saying, oh, this principle, and oh, this, and oh, this. But the end result is what the end result is. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, yeah. um, the whole concept of the confusion, uh, who is Salafi, who's not Salafi, Who's refuted? Who's being refuted? Sheikh Fulan praised us. Sheikh Fulan spoke against this one, so on and so forth. In general and brief, it's all a big game. It's a big game. Mm. Okay, it's a big game. And over the last 20, 25 years, we've seen the results of that game. Yeah. If a person actually is trying to follow the way of the Salaf al-Salih and trying to be Salafi and trying to follow the tradition of Hadith, then nothing would stop him or her from doing that. Mm. Bottom line. That is the you call someone, you're not a Salafi because you said this. You're not a Salafi because you did this and you're a deviant. Okay, no problem. You're not a Salafi and you're a deviant as well because you opposed the Salaf. You didn't travel to Suh'ilm. You didn't study. You didn't go anywhere. You didn't learn anything. Al-ilmu qabl al wal amal. That's the first thing I learned in Surah Talatha. Where is your systematic knowledge? Where is your formal Islamic education? If you love the Salaf so much, how have you not imitated and copied them and emulated them in their relentless talab of in. So let's answer that question first. Let's put that on the table first. Once we do that, everything else becomes easier. And that's because you're not qualified to speak on this issue. You're not qualified to talk about this scholastic science. You have no formal education. We don't want your worthless PDF. We don't want that. We don't want that. You understand? Anyone can write a PDF. Anyone can cut and paste. Ten people can sit in a room and put together an article. Show us where you have followed the way of Imam Ahmed and Bukhari and sought systematic in. Once you do that, then we can talk and we can discuss. That's what I would say. The, the concept of, um, I've got a question for you about Ta'awan um, al-Birri wa taqwa And we talked about this, this concept of uh, people who are Salafi, not working with people who are not Salafi, etc., etc. Where do you stand on this, on this matter? Like, do you, what do you see as, do you see it problematic, for example, if there is an enterprise, whether it's, let's say a Dawa enterprise or a charity enterprise or whatever it is, a project that is to be done and Muslims from different denominations, if there's a common good like a maslaha, a variety maslaha, a common interest for all of those uh, Muslims, that they would work together on, even though, for example, you might have Sufi and Salafi, let's say for the sake of argument. Do you, would you say that so long as... Um, you know, one is, is not, we're not unifying upon the aqaid, or we're not unifying upon creedal positions. But so long as one is able to freely um, distinguish themselves ident by identity, that in some contexts this wouldn't be a problem? Or would you take the hard line position of those individuals that say that it's impossible? I would say that we don't cooperate with anyone unless they're on exactly what we're upon. If they want guidance, they'll come to us. If they want the truth, they'll come to us. It is absolutely haram to go to them, to speak to them, to teach them. You can't do anything in your community, your country, your state. Anyone else that is outside of our gates is a deviant. They're going to the fire of hell, and Allah is angry with them. We are guided. We have the knowledge. These are the scholars that we take from. And the other people that oppose us, they are partisans. They have party partisanship with them, hizbiyah even though we say only us, only me, and the whole entire UK, only these, and the whole Arabia, only these, only, 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 only. 
And we are not to do any cooperation with anyone unless they are 101% absolutely eye to eye on what we're going. That's my creed. And that is the way that the Muslims will unify. And that is the way that the Muslims will stand against their enemies. And that is the way that the Muslims will bring honor and uh, dignity to the name of Islam. And the word of Allah will be the highest in the land through this ideology and through this practice. That's my belief on that. I don't know if you're being, uh, whether that was sarcasm or whether, <laughs> or whether it is. Of course. If a masjid invites me, I've, I've studied in Medina. They said, please come and give a class. I can't give a class. Of course not. I can't give a khutbah. Of course not. If the ignorant Muslims in my city say, oh, we knew you when you were a little kid. Now you, mashallah, you've studied Islam. Please come teach us. Of course I can. <laughs> of course. It's impermissible. <laughs> so, that's, that's my that's my answer to that question <laughs> how would you how would you um on, on a practical level i had conversations with some people who do believe like, on a genuine level that there's no there's no room for cooperation at all no room for cooperation at all in any uh situation um, I, I i would say go back to the scholars that they quote don't look at the proofs and evidences and that's because um, this is something um, very par paradoxical. And if you debate with someone of this mindset, the debate will start off with Quran and Sunnah. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. You bring Quran and Sunnah in your favor, that clearly support you, then they say, well, scholars. You quote that's scholars. That's exactly how it went down. When I spoke to one person. For sure, for sure. You, you quote said, the, alim, the verses that, for general, with ta'awna al-birri, with taqwa. Then they'll say, oh, no, the religion is not about the scholars. It's about yeah, Quran yeah. and Sunnah. You go back to Quran and Sunnah and say, well, who the, from the, the way the discussion the went with me and one of them was that I just said, you know, Ta'awna al birri wa taqwa is a, is a general verse. And, um, and unless you get something which is that does tahsis or specify it, then we have to go with the generality. And what they did was they did a hadith of. You can't, you can't allow the game to go that far. It's a joke. It's a game. Yeah. Once okay. more. Once more. Yeah. Is it permissible for you to go to this masjid? Are they Ahlul Bida? whatever etc you say it is permissible for me to go why is it permissible Allah says this the Prophet says that the, the debate starts off with Quran and Hadith right. if they can't beat you in that then it turns into scholars 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 okay no mm. problem we don't have to mention the proofs of Quran and Hadith let's talk about scholars you quote another scholar three scholars they say no that scholar he's not a specialist in this or he doesn't yeah. know this that's from his mistakes and that's from his errors Okay, we can't win when we talk about scholars. Then can we talk? Can we use uh, the ijma? Can we? Use, the argument will never go anywhere. It starts off with ijtihad and it ends up with taqlid. If you say, "Well, I'm a blind follower of this alim who said it's permissible," to go to say, "No, you can't be a blind follower of him. You can only be a blind follower of our sheikh of this sheikh." So it's a game, and you cannot allow the game to go on. It's not a scholastic debate. It yeah. is not an issue of ilm and ijtihad. It's an issue of love. It's a game. It's a joke. You call them out. You invite them to have a scholastic debate with a condition of no taqlid. They won't accept. Mm. Let me clarify what I meant. Let me explain what I said. No. We will only deal with your recorded statements. We will only cut and paste and edit and interpret how we want to interpret. It's a game. And do not allow the game to go that far, let alone the fact that these people, as I said before, they have not formally studied Islam. They do not deserve that type of respect in which you sit down and have an actual scholastic debate because they're unprepared for that. Quran, Hadith, then it turns into scholars. Scholars, back to Quran. It's a game. And you'll never, ever, ever win. All right? Mm -hmm. And we all know the Imam Chef, Ibrahim Allah Ta'ala, he summed up, up everything. And that is, if you beat them, if you win, if you make a point, then their last frontier is to insult you and to call you a bad name. Why a PDF? He says, ma nadhartu aliman illa ghalabtuhu. Whenever I debated a learned man, I won. And I've never debated an ignorant man except that the ignorant man won. And that's because the weaker your knowledge, the longer your tongue. So you can't win. There's no making no sense out of it. They're, they're not going to listen to anything you say, anything you bring, anything that you prove. If you have a debate that starts off with a system, They'll take it to another system. That's first and foremost. That's first and foremost. Last but not least is, last but not least, the concept of a ta'awun, al-adirri, wa taqwa, what masjid you can and cannot go to. 
I would well, advise. Not just a masjid. I would. I would add to it like um, any would, society, right? Uh, yeah, program. Yeah. Let's ask ourselves these great scholars that we all quote from and learn from, and they quote from. What was their opinion and view? Did Sheikh Rabi go to other countries and other masjids, other centers? The Sheikh Al Bani, Rahimahullah Taala, what masjid did he teach in? What books did he teach? This is a serious question. Yeah. Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah, Sheikh Mukhbir, when he returned from uh, Saudi to Yemen, what masjid did he teach in? What books yeah. did he teach? What subjects did he teach? Between me and you is history. And that is uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak. And many of the salaf, they would say, Whenever they lied and they fabricated, we used history against them. Beautiful. And many of the salaf, they would also say, between us and between them are legs. And what's meant by the legs of the table is the asani, the history. So you're telling me that I can't go into any masjid unless, 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 unless. All right. Let's not talk about Quran and Sunnah because we already know that that will never go nowhere. Mm -hmm. If I quote a verse, you say that's not the proper understanding. I quote a hadith, you say that's not the proper understanding. All right, no problem. A verse that you quote, a hadith that you quote, of course, that's the proper mm -hmm. understanding. Mashallah, no problem. So let's quote the scholars that you quote. And let's go to history. And this is not a slander. I quote, it's not a slander. It's not an accusation. And it's not a lie. But it's a historical fact that Dr. Sheikh Rabir Ibn Hadi Al-Madkhali read his life, where he went, where he traveled, who he taught, who he went out with. How can you say that, or how can you read this and then say, oh no, that's specific to him. Sheikh Rabin, Rahim Ta'ala, read the masjids, and, the books that he taught, and the masjids in which he taught. You'll be shocked what you'll find. Mm. Sheikh Mufra, Rahim Allah, before he established the Maj, read what he did. You'll be shocked. Sheikh Uthaymeen, Sheikh Ben Baz, Rahim Allah, read what they said, read what they did, and you'll be shocked. So let's not talk about Quran and Hadith. Let's not talk about the Athar of the Salaf. Because we'll never, ever go anywhere talking like that. But I'm going to prove to you that you're a hypocrite mm. and that you're a liar and that you hide information and you hide facts and you sweep history under the rug because it's against your agenda. Mm. That's, 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 that's all I would say. And between me and between you is that historical fact. Why haven't you mentioned that about Sheikh Rabi himself? Yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen Sheikh Fauzan and stuff appear on all kinds of shows and all kinds of programs. And I mean, just last year they had like a king's meeting with uh, people from all kinds of denominations. I think some Shiites were there, <laughs> in fact, as well. And they're all or Sufis. They were all uh, taking uh, together. Between, and, uh, me, between me and you is that the Islamic University of Medina. You can't study there because they're Hizbi teachers. People upon the way of Hassan al Banna. These were many scholars and many students of knowledge who studied in Yemen. Say. And it's also paradoxical because they all call themselves Salafi. So those who come from the Maj, they say, and this is, a, this is a fact, it is haram. You cannot study in the Islamic University of Medina. Why can't you? They say because all of your teachers there are not Salafi. They're not upon the correct way. There's the Ikhwan al-Muslimin and Jamaat Tabliq and this and that and so on and so on and so forth. And that's a fact. That is a fact. It's not a conspiracy. That's a fact. Fight. Those who do not like the Salafis of the Maj, do not agree with them, but don't like Sheikh al Hajuri and this one, that one. What do they say? They say, no, that's wrong. You can go to Medina. You can study in Medina. But the Hizbi teachers, the Deviant teachers, you know, you just, you know, you navigate through it. You pick and choose. You take the class and you move forward. All right, no problem. Fight. So I can listen to a Deviant teacher in school for five days out of the week, four years out of my life, but I can't go and teach a class to ignorant Muslims in the masjid. Don't you find that a little hypocritical and contradictory? <laughs> Hilarious. At the least, isn't that a little yeah. hypocritical? Mm. As you mentioned, Sheikh Fozan or this scholar, he appears on this TV program. He goes to this masjid. Sheikh Rabir went out with this group. He taught them. He went out with them. That's fine. But we living in the lands of Kufr and Shirk, in which there are church bells and synagogues and Catholic church. We are not allowed to make any ta'awan, any teaching, any investment, any contribution to our societies unless there's a long, extensive list of conditions and prerequisites. I humbly find that to be extremely hypocritical. The lands of the Muslims were the most harsh and should be used, in which the Sunnis are dominant and backed by the government and paid for and funded. They have the ability to say, no, you can't come here. No, we're not going there. No, we're not speaking here. And for argument's sake, 
if we had to go and do something which was wrong, for argument's sake, due to the necessity of the lands of Kufr in which we live, let alone the fact that these Muslims in this mass shit, they're ignorant. They don't have no formal way. They're cab drivers. They're immigrants. They're people who came home from jail. They need people to teach them, to educate them, and give them the basics of Islam. And you tell me that I cannot go there. But Sheikh Fulan could. And Sheikh Fulan did. I don't see any consistency in your argument. Rather, I find the rules to be extremely hypocritical. And until you establish the consistency and the parallel, until you attack that and speak out against that munkar and that evil, don't say nothing about the UK and America, lands of kufr and shirk. Because you're not, you're not being honest. You're not being honest. And like I said, these are a few examples, and this is not a slander against any scholar. It's historical facts. Historical facts. Read the biography of Sheikh Rabbani, Sheikh Mukhtar, Sheikh Rabbi. Read what they went and what they did and what matches they went into and what they did to establish what they had to establish. Read about it. Don't take yeah. it from me. But we know for sure that they're not going to mention that. Right. They, have, they, they have no scholastic integrity. Because mm. it's a joke. It's a game. Now, uh, to end this podcast, I wanted to ask you now, we've spoken about lots of different things, um, things relating to the preservation of the sunnah, things relating to Talab al -ilm. We also talked about some of the rogue aspects of the community, um, fringe aspects, uh, divide and conquer attitudes of these individuals. I wanted to ask you now general advice, okay, for, for, for the beginner, but now for the for, uh, adaya, for, for the du'a. You know, um, people now, especially in our field, where we're giving dawah to non-Muslims and uh, giving dawah to different types of Muslims who are just coming on practicing and stuff like that. What advice do you give us um, in terms of moving forward and trying to, 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 to strengthen people? Clear. Sincerity. You got to be sincere. Who am I really doing this for? And what do I want for the people? Do I, want really, do I really want good for them? Do I want them to be guided? Or do I want them to remain upon misguidance? And it lies no doubt if you are sincere and you honestly, earnestly want good for someone, it's going to have an effect on what you do and how you do it. And just that one point alone, that attitude of if they wanted the guidance, they would come to us. That's not a sincere approach. Mm. That's not a sincere approach. That's not a sincere approach. If they want it, then they will come to us. If they wanted to be guided, then they would act. That's not sincere. That is a gang mentality. And the monopolizing uh, mentality is that we have the truth and no one else is entitled to it. All right, so sincerity, al-ikhlas. You have to be sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for yourself. Why am I speaking? Why am I talking? Why don't I like you, Muhammad Hijab? Is it for the face of Allah, sincerely? Or is it for other personal reasons? If I don't like you because of something that you did wrong or something that you're saying wrong, then anyone else who does the same thing, also, I'm forced to do what? Hate them as well. But we don't see that. You went there, you spoke, you're a deviant. He went there and spoke, it's a different story. I'll speak with you, I'll talk with you, but I won't speak with this one, I won't talk with this one. That's not sincere. I'll debate with you. I'll debate with anyone. Every time Dick and Harry of all walks of life and religions, I'll sit, talk with them, but I won't say anything to this person. That's not sincere. And that's because there's a clear prejudice in your love and in your hate. Clear or not? Okay, so we have the concept of a noble brother, a noble ustad, a noble teacher. Mashallah, no one's noble except for these people. No one has any respect, no contributions to knowledge, to ilm, except for them. You can't be serious. That's not sincere. And the proof that it is not sincere is that there is a prejudice in your love and in your hate. I love anyone who falls under these conditions, and I hate anyone who does what? Falls under those conditions. So al-ikhlas, al-ikhlas, sincerity for yourself. And having sincere intentions for the people that you're talking to and you're speaking to want good for them. You want them to be guided. You want them to receive Allah's mercy. You want them to know the truth. And now I'm looking for them to go to the fire of hell. I'm searching for their mistakes. I'm searching for their errors. I'm looking for an excuse for me to legitimize them being banished and outcast and damned. That's number one. Number two is common sense. A da'iyah and a layman Muslim you both have the responsibility of using common sense. Do you honestly think and feel that this is the religion of Allah deep down inside this chaotic mess? Do you think this is Islam? Do you think this is what Allah wants from us? Do you think this is, do you think this is scholarship, scholastics? Do you think this is dawah? 
Do you think this is how you're supposed to conduct yourself and behave and carry yourself as a Muslim, as a scholar, as a da'iya? Do you, honor, do you lack sense that much? Not knowledge, but common basic aql. And we all know the value of the mind in the Quran and the hadith and among the salaf of salih. As far as the Quranic ayat, then we don't have to mention Allah says, absar, afala ta'qilun. Okay? Uh, Allah Azawajalim says, uh, Allah praises the mind. He praises good, sound, common sense. Okay? About, Allah praises. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, in so many ahadith, he taught the companions the value of the sound mind. He said, When a man is intimate with his wife, it's charity. What did the companions say? Ya Rasulullah, how can a man fulfill his base desires, his carnal desires, and get a reward from Allah? How does that make sense? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He says that if a man fulfilled his sexual desires in an unlawful way, would he get a sin? Of course he would. So he gave the companions the, 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 the power of the mind, is that you have to see things correctly. Okay? The Salaf al Salih. Uh, such as in the Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala was praised. Many of the scholars of Islam, they say, Ma muhadithan ahsan aqlan Malik. He said, I never saw a scholar of hadith who had a greater mind, a sharper mind, and sounder intellect than Imam Malik. They didn't praise Malik for his piety. They didn't praise him for his ilm. They didn't praise him for his itiba. In this athar, they praised him for his work, for his aqal. So having common sense, and common sense is the foundation of genius. It's a kind, the foundation of a prodigy is to have sound, solid common sense. And it allows no doubt in our minority communities in America, in the UK, in Canada, we're surrounded. You see all the dogs? You hear all the dogs around me? How many dogs did you hear barking so far? <laughs> Countless dogs. We're surrounded by kufr and shirk and innovation. We're surrounded by disobedience. Mm. It is upon me to use my common sense. How can I make things better? How can I contribute to my society? And that mentality of you can't, you have to go back to him, you have to ask his permission, that's not common sense. And we both know that's not common sense, all right? Number three, B'nai Ta'ala, is deserve success. Deserve success. Deserve, success. deserve guidance. Deserve guidance. One of the most influential uh, athletes of the 20th century, uh, one of the most influential of them on me in my life, no doubt about that, is Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was far more than just a boxer. He was much more than just a boxer. And many people, they don't give him his proper status and value. He wasn't just a brute or a brawler. It was far more than that. And his teacher, his mentor, his sheikh, we all know was Customato. And Customato, when he adopted him, he made him his adopted son, and he saw his potential. And he was literally a gifted, gifted young man that would be the youngest heavyweight champion in the history of boxing. And subhanAllah, that proved true. And right before he won the championship, Customato died. Okay, he was younger than Floyd Patterson, all right? So the point, the moral of the story is he gave this man principles and values of life and of boxing. And from those principles and those values was to deserve success. He would tell Mike Tyson, you're not going to win the fight because you're stronger or faster, but you win the fight because you deserve to win the fight. And that's because you trained harder than the next man. You studied it longer. You worked harder. You made your body creak and cringe. You cried out of pain. You deserve to win. So we're confused on who to take from, who to listen to, who to sit with, who's Salafi, who's not Salafi. This person said this about the Quran. This person said this about the Hadith. I don't know what to do, who to learn. I'm confused. Do you deserve guidance? Do you deserve to know how much of the basics of Islam have you studied and mastered? Have you assured for yourself that you deserve not to be confused? So most of us, we want to be guided, we want to be sure, we want to be clear, but we don't deserve it. We're not working for it. We are not studying the fundamentals of Islam. We're not reading the fundamental books of Islam. We're not studying the, the rudimentary things of Islam. And then we have the nerve to say, I'm confused. I don't know who to listen to. You don't deserve to know. You don't deserve to have a, a, a clear distinction because you yourself, you don't value the fundamentals. You haven't trained hard enough. You haven't worked hard enough. And I'm not talking about being a scholar or a student of knowledge. I'm talking about being a fundamentally sound Muslim. So that's a very important piece of advice for myself and for all of us 
is for us to deserve success, deserve victory. And that is by hard work. And most of us are lazy. We're lethargic. We want instant gratification, satisfaction. We want a sheikh to tell us, to give us a fatwa. We want a brother to say, it's, oh, listen to him, and that's it. And we don't want to use our minds. We want to conveniently be spoon-fed and pampered. And then we complain later on when we're lied to. And when we're misguided. And when someone goes astray, we complain. It's so confusing. One day he's on a sunnah, the next day he's on innovation. One day we listen to him, next day he's a staunch innovator. You're going to be led around. You're going to be directed by, you're going to be pulled by the ear by anyone who pulls your ear. And that's because you don't deserve success. So those are the three pieces of advice that I would give. Sincerity for Allah is It's to use your common sense. And be in the Allah is to train and to work hard. And the layman Muslim to comprehending, comprehending the fundamentals of this religion and for a part of ilm to comprehend the usul of ilm which will lead him to dealing with the furu' and the khilafat and the different discrepancies among the scholars which could be intimidating or confusing. And of course, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all success. Jazakumullah khair. It's been a pleasure having you on this podcast. And this is the seventh podcast. Inshallah, I'm going to try and put them all uh, up on some kind of SoundCloud uh, platform. What I was going to say is, uh, could you just tell people about your YouTube channel and your Instagram and some of your socials for people that wanted to follow you? Jazakumullah uh, khairan for hosting me once again. It was my pleasure. And I would say that, um, alhamdulillah, we have hadithdisciple.com, hadithdisciple.com. Uh, and uh, on YouTube, we have several channels. We have Hadith Disciple, and we have Mufti Q&A. Also on Instagram, uh, we have different lessons, quotes that we post on Facebook as well. And basically, Hadith Disciple uh, is something that has been fermenting in my mind for many, many years. Uh, when I first started the YouTube channel in 2012, it was called Hadith Studies. And Alhamdulillah, I always wanted to do something for myself, by myself. I always wanted to be, inshallah, some type of key towards good. And I wanted to share what Allah gave me. I wanted to allow people to have access to certain things that they wouldn't normally have access to via video, via audio, the books that we discuss, the things that we quote from, so on and so forth. And some of the things that we like and we love, Ibn Qayyim, we like to share with people. So that's what Hadith Society was about. That's what Mufti Q&A is about. Uh, people, they ask questions. People, they post requests. We do different khutbahs. So many things that are innovative, five minutes of faida, book reviews, different things like this, in which we have two main themes. The first theme is to introduce the layman Muslim to the sciences of the sunnah and the sciences of hadith, the mustalah, the terminology, the books, Bukhari, the preservation, how the sunnah was preserved in detail. Because obviously a podcast, we can't mention everything, right? And also to give the, the Muslims uh, advice, admonishments, guidance and benefits those are the main points of hadith disciple and alhamdulillah it's much more than just a website or a youtube channel but we consider it to be a mindset or as we said a philosophy we consider it to be a school of thought a way of looking at things a way of practicing things emptying the cup researching studying loving knowledge and being formless being formless not being rigid and stuck to one way or to one path or to one person or to one place these are some of the guiding principles and some of the guiding values of Hadith Disciple. And I'm very proud and I'm very happy and I'm very grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired me to share some of these things with the Muslims and now Muslims as well. May Allah bless you and Jazakumullah khairan for coming on the show. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, cool. May Allah continue to guide you. May Allah keep you firm. May Allah educate all of us, guide us to the straight path. And may Allah guide us about that which the people differ. And we're all going to stand in front of Him on the Day of Judgment. And he's going to be the only judge, the only king, and we're going to reap what we saw. This was the seventh episode of the MH podcast. Jazakumullah khairan to you for listening to all of it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.